and to avoid starvation, we must devise effective means for pest control. Note that we have to spray something and control all the insects, but it should be effective means of pest control. So there, the research is required. How to control this pest without damaging our environment? So that is the main aspect. Why should we study entomology? So what causes an insect population to attain pest status? Daily, we are hundreds and thousands of insects we are encountering in our daily life. So many are there, ants, mosquitoes, caterpillars, butterflies, so many are there. But all these are not our pest. So what causes an insect population to attain pest status? There are many factors, but when we categorize mainly, one is invasion. Invasion means those were not as a pest in our country, but when it was introduced to our country, it becomes a pest. So these are called invasive pests. So we know that now international travel, rapidity and volume is very high than the previous years because only because of these COVID issues and all, very recently two years travel is less, but otherwise international travel was uh, uh, much, much uh, advanced than the previous, previous era. So this rapidity and volume of international travel itself is a cause of invasion and commerce also. Because e-commerce is very common and shipments coming here and there and without much quarantine. Now that word quarantine is very familiar for us because of this COVID-19 pandemic. So this quarantine issue is there for the commodities also. So the, there is the lack of quarantine or there is a, a loss of quarantine sometimes leads to invasions. Then ecological changes that is beyond our hands. Intensive agriculture that too mainly monoculture and biodiversity simplifications. What is that? If we are interested or fascinated to a crops, we just uh, sow that crop to large areas. So that biodiversity is compromised with that. And the, if an insect is pressed to that crop, there is umpteen chances for it to multiply and then to become a very serious problem. Then selection of high yielding plants. That is of course required because in your, this course itself, you will be having agronomy, genetics and all classes. And high yielding plants is a must. But most of the hybrids and high yielding plants are much susceptible to pest attack. Eliminate or we have to do for a screening and then uh, what to say, genetic modifications or things like that. But uh, normally in the routines, when the farmer is just planting a high yielding plant, it, many, it, it, especially in coconut, it invites many pests. Then eliminating competitors by agrotechnics because we just want to protect one crop. So we are warding off all the means, uh, um, what to say, alternate host of the natural enemies. So that also causes a pest to increase. Human interventions like, uh, just as, as I had told already, favorable for certain species. So that uh, always we should have a multi-species cropping system and a diversity of crops should be there. So even if a species is becoming a pest, there is a chance that lot of chances that a natural enemy also build up also will be there on alternate host or nearby other plants. Then socioeconomic changes also leads to pest attack, like market value of a product. Suppose a, a particular product is of high value, farmer will be more inclined to produce that one alone. So that you complete the season over the season, same uh, crop will be there. So the residue crop will harbor more of the pest and uh, the next season also there is a chance of more pest attack. Cost of pesticides. Then consumer habits and taste. These are some of the socioeconomic changes also that also leads for a simple organism to become a major pest. It may be a minor, very minor pest sometimes, but due to some of these factors, it can attain a pest, major pest status. Then how to tell what is eating our plants? So here, dear student, there are plenty of potential culprits around out and just so many ways to stop them also. It is not that if a pest is attacking your plant, the, uh, we, we had to just spray and then kill them. That is not that. 
there are so many uh, methods in pest management you might have studied already chemical mechanical cultural biological like that so there are so many ways to control the pest so our aim is always to control the pest as i have told already it is to protect our environment first one health approach protect our environment first then control the pest so we have to do smart diagnosis and smart decisions also decision making also is very important and diagnosis also is very important suppose one particular species of insect is attacking our crop we have to identify it correctly what it is then only we can control it so the taxonomy also is plays a very important role in pest management so there are broadly two options for a pest manager one is chemical option another is biocontrol option biological option so chemical option is more uh, what to say more attractive that is broad spectrum if you spray something for one pest the whole, total all the pest will be wiped out quick action is the long residual effect will be there because you spray this week next week or a two three months there won't be any pest attack then you will get high yield but there is no target effect and environment and health problems always but when you choose the other aspect that is biological control it is target specific if you are just aiming at one pest coconut black headed caterpillar your biocontrol agent will pick that one and control that alone but the effect is very slow you release the parasitoid today you will not get any result tomorrow or next month or so so you have to wait slowly patiently but it is self sustainable once it is there in the environment once it is there in the system ecosystem it will multiply there and control the pest always the suppress the pest below the economic threshold level and there is no residue effect and total environmental safety and ecological sustainability these two aspects when we consider we have to go more and more towards the biocontrol options for pest management so coming to our crop coconut there are more than 800 species of insects are reported from coconut uh, uh, during different periods of its growth but fortunately very few of them are major pest very few of them we have to control only the countable ones five or six ones are major pest they are leaf eating caterpillar now we recently introduced rugo spiraling white fly red palm weevil rhinoceros beetle rheophyte mite white grubs and few minor pest also so these only we have to manage for a effective uh, sustainable yield from coconut so coming to the first major pest that is red palm weevil so you have to just remember the name scientific name of red palm weevil is rhinchophorus ferruginius rhinchophorus ferruginius you might have heard this name and especially throughout india in coconut cultivation this pest is available so you might have also seen the pest and <clears throat> sorry it is uh, ferruginous means it is the color of the insect it is ferruginous color some kind of a metallic color and uh, about this pest it is the most destructive pest and fatal enemy of coconut palm in india it can kill the coconut palm by its infestation the weevils scoops out small holes on the soft portion of the palm and lay the eggs and serious threat to date palm cultivation in middle east countries it is the major pest of date palm also as well as oil palm also and uh, this infects the pamira palm oil palm sago talipot palm and so many other palm species now arecanut also very recently we have seen uh, damage by red palm we will to arecanut also but the most important thing is that this pest is the fatal enemy of coconut it can kill the coconut palm no other pest can kill the palm but here red palm we will can kill the palm and here economic threshold level is 1% of infected palm even 1% of palm in the garden even one palm in the garden is infected we have to go for control measure that is the importance of this pest because one palm takes about 5 to 7 years for bearing 
So even one palm is lost, it is the ETL level. So here you, here you can see the pictures, how it looks like. You might have al already seen these red palm weevils. So these are the eggs. Eggs are scooped and out to the soft portion of the palm tissues. That is about two to three days, the egg hatch out. And uh, fecundity is about uh, average 175 eggs per female. So that uh, huge damage potential you can just guess. Single female can lay about uh, on an average 175 eggs. So single female attack can kill the palm. Larval period is 70 to 85 days, prolonged larval period, active feeding period, then about 12 to 30 days uh, pupal period and adult longevity itself is more than four months, three to four months. So that itself is a spread of the pest is very, very high. And here you can see the larval instars. There are 10 larval instars, but here these photographs, you can just note that the morphological size varies very much. And the markings on the pronotum also, there are certain markings on the pronotum, one, two, three, four uh, dots, black dots, that also varies, but it is not a species difference. All are Rhynchophorus ferruginous only. Then how it attacked the coconut? So pest entry sites, mainly three sites of entry are noticed in the field. One is palm crown through the crown region of the palm. Second is through the leaf axil and third is through the bowl region. So the bowl region entry is mainly in hybrids and dwarf varieties of coconut. And uh, this leaf axil damage mainly uh, through uh, rhinoceros beetle attacked sites. And the palm crown entry is mainly through uh, rotings or other kind of a uh, rotting uh, leaf rot or bud rot disease induced the pest entry sites. So here, these uh, there are certain factors that uh, help predisposes the pest to to attract the pest to lay eggs on this palm. So what are these? These are fungal diseases like leaf rot and bud rot. Here you can see a leaf rot infected palm. So here, this is the site and some kind of a smell will be there from these rotting tissues. And this particular kind of a fermenting smell emanating from the palm attract the weevil for egg laying. Here you can see the weevil laid eggs here. So the, as I told you, the egg will hatch in one or two days and it will gain entry to the palm crown. And another thing is that uh, injuries on the palm. In some uh, places, uh, people uh, uh, make cuts on the stem for a uh, palm climbing, step cutting. So that uh, causes a kind of injury in the palm and that, that injury also emanates some kind of a smell and the weevil is attracted to egg laying that side up. And another thing is that rhinoceros beetle damage to the spindle spear leaf region. So this also, this damage, the smell from this damage attracted the weevil for egg laying. So how we can identify whether the palm is infested with red palm weevil? Of course, there are a lot of symptoms, but mostly farmers identify the infestation at this final stage when the crown toppling stage. So nothing can be done. But the palm actually says that it is infected. So for that, there are so many symptoms uh, like holes on the stem. So many holes will be there on the stem and some kind of a brown fluid will be coming out from these holes. Splitting of the petioles, the lower petiole base splitting or simply wilting of the central shoot. So these are the symptoms of red palm weevil infestation. So if we notice any of these symptoms, immediately we have to go for curative treatment. So what are the strategies for integrated pest management? First of all, sustain the surveillance and removal of dead palm. If one palm is infected, it is already dead and crown toppled. It cannot, no way there is recovery. So that palm has to be cut and removed from the site. Otherwise, it will harbor three, four more generations in that palm itself and pest will be spread to nearby young palms. 
prophylactic leaf axle treatment for fungal diseases like as i had told leaf rot and bud rot are two major uh, predisposing factors so that has to be treated immediately then curative treatment with the pesticides that i'll tell what are the pesticides we are using then avoid injuries on the trunk pheromone trapping then pests are very active flyers and the continuity of coconut plantations in uh, especially in kerala and in most of the coconut growing areas continuity of plantations are there so it necessitates adoption of ipm in community basis single farmer activity may not suppress the pest to a desirable level here i had shown two photograph you just guess out why what for i, I had shown this photograph so i think uh, because of this this is all video classes now there is uh, no uh, opportunity for a immediate uh, response from you so of course uh, this is when we are cutting the petioles of these young plants never cut it very close to the palm trunk this is an injury on the leaf so this injury very close to the palm trunk attract the weevil for egg laying and the weevil laying egg here will access to the palm trunk the grubs will reach the trunk in a week time so this this palm bowl entry will be there and the palm will die and the next photograph you can see this is okay what i am telling is that the petiole you can see the petiole at least 1 meter length is there so this tip is cut from here where the leaflets are uh, coming so this much length of petiole should be the retained on the palm whenever in even in juvenile palms or in adult palms whenever leaves are cut that petiole at least a uh, 1 meter length petiole should be retained in the palm here also the weevil can come and lay eggs but those eggs hatching in two days slowly the grubs will travel this petiole and then it has to reach the trunk by the time the petiole will dry up and it will be unpalatable for the grubs and the grub will die there itself so this is the correct approach for uh, management of red palm weevil infested areas especially whenever leaf is cut a, a one meter length petiole should be retained in the palm another thing is that prophylactic leaf axle filling leaf axle we know that uh, the axle of the frond is known as leaf axle so the leaf axle we put some kind of a repellent very young seedlings we can use naphthalene balls here you can see the naphthalene balls put in the leaf axle then cover with the sand or we can use neem cake plus sand at the rate of 250 g neem cake plus sand or uh, chloranthrinipol granules in sachets uh, very small 3 uh, g sachets we make and we insert these sachets into the leaf axils and uh, uh, cpcri also has developed a certain kind of botanical pellets and botanical paste formulations for leaf axil filling that is also very effective and very simple methodology is nylon netting the leaf axil area so that also ward off this uh, red palm weevil as well as rhinoceros beetle and uh, we can protect the very young juvenile palms uh, uh, from the beetle and weevil attacks then uh, coming to the red palm weevil what chemical we have to use for curative treatment if the palm is really infected so that earlier we were using carbaryl now that is not available or banned or uh, in coconut and even production is not there so now we are using imidacloprid it is giving very good result about 80% success is there as well as we can use indoxacarb or spinosad all these three chemicals are effective in management of red palm weevil the insecticide has to be applied to the palm uh, it has to reach inside the palm in the infestation site and you can see if it is crown and re we can see that how the recovery of the palm in even within 10 days the new spindle will be coming out
Then there is the pheromone technology, aggregation pheromone lure, furrow lure plus in food baited bucket traps earlier we were using. Now that is in nanopores delivery matrix is available for uh, slow release and uh, long duration the pheromone can be used. So uh, CPCRA also uh, started uh, producing this pheromone. And uh, um, in bucket traps, the proper servicing of the trap is uh, very much essential. And this technology has to go for a community approach. Single farmer approach is not uh, very feasible because it is active flies, at, as I had told earlier. So it has to be uh, uh, done in community-based approach. So these are some of the areas we had, we had done these uh, um, management strategies, validations. Uh, so here you can see that from 6.07, we could bring down it to 1.17 in a period of three years. So anything in coconut, any result you have to get, we have to do the experiment, not it is a, uh, as you may be knowing about many annual or short duration crops, but coconut being a perennial crop, the pest management also takes a lot of time. So. For a, uh, for a community approach and for a large area, area-wide demonstration, it takes at least two to three years for a sustainable result. Now, uh, the recent approach in uh, pest management in Red Farm Weevil is a detector that is a, a sensor-based electronic detector that uh, we are in the process of developing it with a uh, private partnership also. So they had developed a sensor-based detector for detecting these red palm weevil. It is a sound-based detector. So this uh, is the current uh, aspect in this uh, uh, research of red palm weevil, current thing going on. Actually, a prototype is available, but uh, more validation has to be done. Then another aspect is that uh, insect growth regulators, Cigna, Luffy neuron uh, was found to be very effective in causing malformations in the red palm weevil. Uh, that also in the pipeline for uh, further research work. Then another very novel idea is uh, 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 that is entomopathogenic nematodes. Uh, CPCRI is having a special isolator of CPCRI S0804, that is Tainer Nima species, that is 100% effective in laboratory condition against red palm weevil. And the most beautiful thing about this nematode is that it survives in the ambient temperature uh, up more than one year, even without a refrigeration. So uh, our scientists has developed a capsule formulation of the cadavers, and we are using this for prophylactic leaf axle filling for, uh, to prevent the red palm weevil attack. So this, is the, uh, uh, so this is about red palm weevil. So coming to the next pest is a rhinoceros beetle. A rhinoceros beetle is the most ubiquitous pest of coconut. It is seen in all the Throughout the world, wherever coconut cultivation is there, this pest is also available. So oh, it uh, here you can see the life cycle, egg, uh, grub, pupa, and adult. All these stages, egg, grubs, and pupae are within our reachable uh, limits. And only the adult is harmful here. Whereas in the case of red palm weevil, all the stages were harmful. Grubs were more harmful. And adults also scoops out and lays the eggs. But here only the adult is damaging the palm. And uh, all the stages are seen in the decaying organic matter like decaying cow dung, compost pits, and uh, decaying coconut logs like that. And the nature of damage is that usually this kind of damage is the main symptom that was known to us earlier, that is the geometric cut on the leaves. V-shaped geometric cuts on the leaves. But very recently, we found that sometimes the drying of the total inflorescence is there. So this also is due to rhinoceros beetle attack. It is bore hole into the spear leaf region. So this is the petiole supporting this bunch. So here you can see a hole in the petiole. So the uh, beetle bore a hole and the 
inflorescence base also is damaged. It leads to the inflorescence drying. And more in recent years, very young transplanted seedlings are highly damaged by rhinoceros beetle. It totally retards the growth also. So these are the breeding signs of rhinoceros beetle. It is very, very much uh, near to the coconut plantation like cow dung pits, then coconut trunk where uh, coconut plant is dead or removed and the base is there or even the drying coconut trunks then compost pits, all these harbor a lot of these pest stages. You can see how many grubs and adults are there available, sure. available in these breeding grounds. So this, so the pest is multiplying in the farm itself and damaging the crop. So how to control this one? So first, this one is mechanical hooking of the beetle. So a, a, a Little bit experience with the uh, iron road uh, that uh, infestation site is very much uh, visible outside like chewed up fibers will be there. So you can see the beetle can be hooked out with a metal road. So this is called a mechanical hooking of beetle. So first step, if any damage is there, damage symptom is there in the spindle region, first the beetle has to be hooked out then that area has to be filled with a neem cake and some fungicide. Then the most economical and relatively host specific method is biological control for rhinoceros beetle. So two endemopathogens we are using for that one, Metarhysium anisoplea and Dorectus rhinoceros nudivirus. So uh, you may be knowing about these endemopathogens uh, like uh, Metarhysium anisoplea is known as green muscardine fungus. Here, these are the spores. Their spores are single spore is dumbbell shaped. And usually when we make a, a slide out of, we can see that chain, chain structure of these spores. This is the Metarhysium infected grub. And we have developed a farmer participate reproduction technology in uh, rice or jowar based uh, uh, grain media. So that uh, uh, farmer, farm women are empowered in this and uh, uh, to, to what to say, to cater the local needs. They can produce locally and uh, uh, apply in their breeding sites. So actually this metrisium was first reported in 1913. And in India, the first uh, detailed observation by Dr. Nirula et al. in 1955 itself. But the same work is continued till date. And the beauty is that same isolate of metrisium. There is no resistance uh, or no strain difference or no variation. The same metrisium is 100% effective even now. So the culture we are maintaining at uh, CPCRI uh, Kasaragod as well as in regional station Kayangulam. So this is a wonderful agent and the farmers can multiply and the technology is very simple and large area demonstrations also done and it's a thorough and what to say classical example. And the next one is Orictus rhinoceros nudivirus. You might have sometimes heard of baculovirus. Actually, this was earlier known as Orictus baculovirus. But the correct, uh, uh, correct uh, name now is Orectus rhinoceros nudivirus. So uh, we have to release this one. Here, uh, the production uh, or maintenance is on Orectus rhinoceros grubs itself. Here you can see that when these are the uh, viral particle under electron microscope, and when the grubs get infected with the rhinoceros, uh, this ORNV, it multiplies in the midgut. Here you can see the midgut is filled with a fluid. So this is the total virus inoculum. And what we are doing is that this one cutting and removing this virus from, uh, virus infected midgut region, then inoculating to the adults. Uh, just a few drops uh, inoculating this viral uh, inoculum to the adult and then releasing the adult in the field uh, per hectare 10 to 12 beetles are required. So this is known as auto transmission. 
and this also is very effective technology for management of rhinoceros bee so these are the process of inoculation of rnv first that midgut has to be cut and removed then it has to be macerated uh, and very well mixed with the insect saline then feeding the grubs and maintaining the culture in the uh, as much as uh, culture we have to maintain we have to feed in the grubs then maintain the grubs uh, with the food so in 10 12 days the grubs shows the symptoms of virus infection so the grubs again we can use for uh, culture production or these culture we have to inoculate in the adults as i told like a few drops to the adult or allow the adult to wade through the inoculum there also it gulps and get the virus infection then keeping the adult one or two days in the laboratory without food then releasing in the field then through the fecal matter it spread the virus to the total breeding sites so this is the simplest technology uh, that is uh, that is also doable by the farmers so this kind uh, this uh, technology also first demonstrated in lakshadweep islands then followed by andamans and then in mainland more than uh, 2000 hectares uh, different agencies cpcra state agriculture universities and all had uh, uh, demonstrated this technology against the rhinoceros bee then another uh, aspect is uh, insect growth regulatory effect with a, a very simple plant that is known as clerodendron infortunatum this particular plant it has some kind of a insect growth regulatory chemical in that one known as clerodendron so this plant we have to just pick up and then put in the bre- breeding site breeding sites means cow dung or if a farmer is composting in the composting pit so it mix up with the compost in uh, very few days and uh, uh, the grubs happen to feed on this uh, uh, clerodendron uh, mixed food uh, it causes hormone regulations and uh, larval pupil intermediate or uh, uh, abnormal adult uh, that kind of uh, malformations are formed in the insect so this is the very simple technology uh, very easy for farmers for adoption another thing is then again the pheromones here also we are using that is the uh, but the trap design is something different pvc traps but here also the pheromone is nano nano matrix uh, uh, loaded one for a long release but the pheromone is uh, ethyl four methyl octonate here the dose is five traps per 25 hectare or one trap per 5 hectare here also 30 to 40 beetles per trap per month is captured and more of females are captured it is not that only females are captured it is an aggregation pheromone both males and females are captured but more of the females are uh, uh, trapped then uh, that uh, how this technology was taken to the field here you can see that as i had told earlier so much a thousand hectare in uh, krishnaburam that is near to kayankulam cpcra then mogralputur that is near to kasaragod cpcra then many three villages in alapura district means large large area demonstrations were done with the uh, uh, 60 to 70% control of this pest 100% control is not not at all possible with a biocontrol agent that always you have to keep in mind if you are spraying a chemical for a pest management you get a 100% control but after a period of time pest resurgence will be there but if you are using biocontrol you get 70 to 80% control in a in a 3 uh, to 6 months time but that is sustainable that slowly over the period of time you can attain up to 70 uh, 90% control in certain pest but it is sustainable so a pest, uh, a pest residue always will be there in the uh, uh, ecosystem for the natural enemy to multiply so that is the difference between the biocontrol and the chemical options so as i had told we had developed the technology for farm level mass production these are the farm women multiplying metarhizium and the that capacity building that is a Uh, for farm women for uh, income generation as well as the uh, um, but what to say cater their local needs availability of the bioagents locally 
So this also we had done a lot of, lot of uh, community approach uh, village-wise. At least a village or a sizable uh, amount of land has to be taken uh, at a stretch for management practice. But uh, one thing just I want to tell you, dear students, this Orictus rhinoceros new virus, as I had told, is very effective in India. And the strain was isolated in uh, 1981 by Dr. Mohan. And still, it is working very well. But very recently, in 2007, coconut rhinoceros beetle, very high damage by rhinoceros beetle, was uh, reported from Guam. Guam Island, and they found that this particular kind of rhinoceros beetle is resistant to ORNV. That is the, now they call as Guam strain of rhinoceros beetle, coconut rhinoceros beetle, Guam strain. This just, this name you have to remember, Guam strain. So that is the ORNV resistant hoplotype. So here uh, they found that uh, their ORNV release is not able to suppress their rhinoceros beetle. So we also at uh, uh, CPCRI, we had uh, done a lot of uh, work, uh, research work on this one. And we found that at least naturally we get 1.2% of the uh, rhinoceros grubs, whatever we are collecting from the field, get a natural infection. This is also another symptom that it is the grub is infected with a uh, uh, ORNV extrusion of uh, uh, rectum. Rectum comes out because the target pressure in the midgut increase and slowly the uh, extrusion of the rectum occurs. So this also another symptom of rhinoceros uh, ORNV infection. And this was characterized actually uh, the Guam strain, they told that the rhinoceros beetle, there is a 288 base pair, there is a transition from AA to uh, TTAA, but A to G transition, A uh, TG transition is there. So that particular one nucleotide transition is causing the resistance. So, but in our rhinoceros beetle, there is no A to G transition and it is still susceptible to ORNB. Then coming to the next pest, that is the leaf eating caterpillar, that also is a defoliator that is affecting the leaves. So, here coming to the history of the pest, it is 1907, it is first reported on Pamera palms in Coimbatore. Then 1909 itself in coconut in Bapatla, Andhra Pradesh. And in a period of by 1930, it has spread throughout Kerala and a uh, uh, lot of work was done on this pest on biocontrol aspects. So here, this is the life cycle, egg period five days, total life cycle is completed in a period of two to two and a half months. So here, biological suppression is the classical example for management of this pest. Lot of parasitoids are available, more than 40 parasitoids are uh, associated with the pest in the field and uh, a few of them were selected for field release. So how we have to select the few ones? What are the criteria to select a parasitoid? There should be more females in the parasitoids because females can only lay eggs. Then there should be host searching ability and the parasitoid also should have the ability to multiply when the pest is in the higher stage. Just like Opicina arenocella, that is the leaf-eating caterpillar damage is more during summer months. So if the parasitoid is not active in the summer, means it is of no use. But we select those parasitoids that can multiply in the summer also, should have higher progeny, and also should be amenable for mass production in the laboratory. So based on these characters, Certain parasitoids were selected, especially Goniosis nephandidis, Bracon brevicornis, Elasmus nephandidis, Trichospilus pipivora, and Brachymeria nosetoi. You need not have to remember all these names, at least you remember Goniosis nephandidis, that is the larval parasitoid. Bracon brevicornis, that also is a larval parasitoid. So these both, Goniosis in and Bracon, are being multiplied in Corsera larva, and it is very much amenable for 
lab multiplication. So these release of parasitoids could achieve 95 to 98 percent pest suppression in a period of two years. But the history of this pest biological suppression is long, long back. Pest management under Madras Agriculture Department started in 1926 itself. When there was 1922, a serious outbreak in Mangalore area, then the uh, department, agriculture department and collector of Mangalore has to enact the Pest Act it was enforced on 1st January 23. Be forcibly under law, the uh, 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 pest suppression was, uh, activities for pest suppression they had taken up because uh, many farmers were reluctant to cut some of the fronds and do things like that. But it was a, what to say, just like our vaccination now, everybody has to do like that. Uh, it has to be, the certificate has to be produced when we have to go for travel, things like that. So here, the uh, with these pest act enforced, and it was uh, for three, four years, they enforced with, with a lot of uh, effort and the pest was totally brought under control. Even they purchased a boat in 1929, fitted with the facility to serve as a floating laboratory. And in the coastal Kerala, this boat laboratory was working in 1929. And 1926 itself, the first parasite breeding laboratory was set up in Calicut. So this is the history of biological control of Opicina arenocella. So, here also, same parasitoids are even now working, and some of the uh, demonstrations by CPCRI, you can just can you just notice these are the same places, Ullal, that is that uh, South Karnataka. Here, same farms after a period of two years or one and a half, 18 months usually it takes by 18 months because one leaf will fall off in one month. So, all the leaf to fall off and new leaves to emerge without a pest attack. It takes a minimum of 18 months to, to see some difference. And this is the Padukere experiment. You can see the total same cost, totally free of pest attack. And how the parasitoids are released? They are multiplied in tubes and then releasing on the palm trunk. So it just climbs, then flies, and then find the host. The host searching ability is there. Then this is some of the South Kerala experience like uh, Kotayam here, you can the same area, how the palms are recovering. Then Trivandrum also same building, you can see these are the infested palm locality and same palms are recovering uh, after a period of uh, 12 to 18 months. Then coming to the next major pest is white grub. And these are mainly confined to the sandy loam uh, tracks of Kerala and Karnataka. And this is known as Leucopholis coniophora. So there are actually three species of Leucopholis infesting palms. Leucopholis coniophora is the coconut white grub, Leucopholis lepidophora, and Leucopholis burmistry. These are the arachnid white grubs. But uh, the coconut, mainly the species is Leucopholis. Coniophora. Here also the life cycle is annual life cycle and the larval period is around 260 days. So larval period is the damaging stage, adults are not feeding. So the grubs can actively damage the coconut and as well as the intercrops, coconut, arachnid and the intercrops in a very long duration. So in the seedlings, uh, it may uh, result in the death of the seedling when all the roots are damaged, you, naturally the seedling will die. But in the older plantation, the damage to the roots uh, cause the, uh, the roots cannot take the nutrients and reflex in the yellowing, then button shedding and so many other uh, external symptoms. So here the technology is now mainly biocontrol based. Uh, but the IPM package in severely infested areas uh, has one chemical also, either imidacloprid or bifenthrin. But the stain of Nima carpocapse is a very beautiful nematode uh, that works very well with the uh, um, white grubs. At the rate of 1.5 into 10 raised to 9 IJs per hectare is uh, uh, drenching the root zone with these nematodes gives a very good control of white grubs. 
so uh, nematodes uh, are, are working very well in coconut system uh, especially for the white grape coconut as well as arachnid white grape management nematodes are uh, 100% successful and uh, uh, another uh, nematode is now we are working for is for red palm weevil management so this biosuppression of arachnid white grape through epn the technology is commercialized and the many farmers are coming forward to learn this technique and to start their own small startup group uh, small groups for production of nematodes and 91.8% uh, reduction in root grape population is observed so this is a uh, wonderful another wonderful uh, example of biological control in plantation crops then another uh, pest is corid bug. Actually, it is not a major pest, but in certain locations, uh, especially in recent years, maybe due to climate change and many other factors, lot of button shedding is observed. So sometimes the total bunch, uh, the sm small buttons will dry up there itself. So this is these are the corid bug, and uh, the corid bug. Uh, uh, suck the sap. It is a sucking insect. Suck the sap from the developing buttons and crinkles the nuts or sometimes it results in barren nuts so either neem oil emulsion or chloranthrinipole is recommended for management of this one then coming to rat uh, rats are you know very severe damage in uh, minicoy and all the luxury islands and uh, it damages the tender nuts and nut fall occurs it makes a hole near the calyx region and here the uh, management is by different kind of uh, traps like live or dead traps and the bands for uh, preventing the uh, rodents to climb the palms or single uh, dose anticoagulant rodent side bromodilone is used in cake formulation it is available in market so that that has to be kept on the palm where the rat damage is there so as I told already in all the examples, area wide technology transfer through uh, farmer field school is one uh, option or any kind of area wide technology transfer through farmer participation is a must, especially in plantation crops for pest management and linkage with the different stakeholders to be there for the visibility, co-learning and sustainability. A single farmer approach is not uh, uh, very much recommended in coconut uh, pest management. But uh, uh, I was just telling about the major pest, but there are some insects are now coming or to coconut uh, as invasives. So that invasives totally, uh, another class will be there on Saturday for invasive pests. That's, that's why I have not dealt with the mite or uh, white flies. So that uh, next class, it will be the detailed about the coconut area fight mite, all the invasive pests, how to deal with that one. But there are certain changes in global climate change is uh, causing changes in species distributions. So that also is causing a lot of concern for us for pest management. So these current and future global uh, climate change that will definitely affect the agriculture systems. So that cause gradient pest outbreaks and efficiency loss of uh, some of the beneficial insects also, just like uh, uh, loss of honeybees, then loss of parasitoids, all these are occurring. So direct and indirect losses are there due to climate change. So one example is slack caterpillars. Slack caterpillars are actually very, very minor pest on coconut. There are mainly three species, Macroplectra nerraria, Contaila rotunda, Parasa lepida. So these are three uh, major slugs, uh, slug caterpillars, what we are uh, observing in coconut, but usually there may be one or two in the total plantation and it will be suppressed by the natural enemies. But sometime due to this climate change or indiscriminate spraying of some insecticide in the component crop or in coconut itself, it kills all the natural enemies and the pest can attain a major pest status. It occurred in some of the villages in Karnataka and as well as uh, Tamil Nadu. So uh, this is the reason either the farmer or the nearby farmer might have sprayed something and that might have killed the natural enemies of this pest and this pest flare up occurs. 
So sometimes due to temperature and other conditions also gradient outbreaks occurs. So uh, if uh, slug caterpillars uh, major uh, problem is there spraying BT formulation and collection of adult by light trap is recommended. And uh, sometimes mealybugs also, it's very minor in coconut like a pseudococcus cocotis on spadix and rachile, then dismicocus on the leaves, then pharisia virgate also on the leaf mealybug, then nipococcus nippei, that is the root mealybug. But these all academic interest, these are all reports, not major pest, but it can, it have the potential and sometimes it may be a, it can come out as a major pest also. Just like another one is scale insect. Scale insect in coconut is a, uh, it's almost seen everywhere. In almost uh, every garden, you can see the scale insect, but it has never caused any damage. But sometimes you can see the whole palm is, uh, all the leaves dried due to scale insect. So when we inquired deep into it, we found that farmer used to apply insecticide to all his plants in every month. So it might have killed all the natural enemies. Usually the scale insects are brought under check by natural enemies like uh, Pharaoh's gymnus, then Chylochorus, Sasagis gymnus, so many ladybird beetles wonderfully uh, predate upon the scale insects. And uh, it is a very uh, suppressed, natural biosuppression is there. But another thing we have to keep in mind is there, there is a scale insects in Philippines as pediotus rigidus that is becoming an invasive and so far it is not reported from India. So if you somebody asks you to write about a scale insect of coconut, it is only as pediotus distracted so far in our country. As pediotus rigidus is not reported so far from India. It's an invasive, there is a chance that anytime it can come. So uh, uh, I was talking about so much of biocontrol also because I am much inclined towards biocontrol. Biocontrol, uh, if an invasive pest is there, we have to go for the natural enemies. And how that natural enemy is not available in the country, how we have to bring it to our country. So one institute is there under Indian Council of Agriculture Research. You all may be knowing about that. That is the National Bureau of Agricultural Insect Resources. NBAIR that is located in Bangalore. So they have all the insect collections also well-maintained insect repository collection is there. And they have the, they are the authorities to uh, import the natural enemies and they will be quarantined there and all the studies will be done mass production and that it should be safe to all the flora and fauna of our country, then only it will be released to the field. So this is that institute being a graduate student, you must know about this one. That's why I just mentioned about this one. So dear friends, when you buy mosquito repellent, cockroach sprays or any pesticide, please watch out. That one health management should be there. Uh, it is uh, the, the globe is not only for ours, it is for all the other insects and all the, uh, all the other organisms also. So the poisons totally we have to avoid and very, very much careful we have to use the yellow dandered insecticide and still there is danger in uh, blue label and cautiously we can use the green labeled insecticide. So that is the message you have to take to your Mm, people also. And uh, now we are thinking or talking very much about immunity boosters for ourselves. Uh, especially in the COVID pandemic, we are very much concerned about health and our immunity boosters. So the palms also, the, not only the coconut palm, all the plant also, if you give an immunity booster, it will prevent pest attack to, to a larger extent. So what is the immunity booster for coconut palm? integrated nutrient management that always rejuvenate the infested farms, balanced NPKs, organics, cover crops, moisture concern, these classes already or you are going to have all these classes. So it is a one health approach. Not only that pest is there, you spray something and kill the pest. It is the total health of the ecosystem and farmer participatory area-wide field delivery linkages has to be developed. And the key factor is that 
closer planting uh, and injuries that has to be avoided. And always we have to accommodate more and more biodiversity in the farm. Then uh, it will always reduce the pest attack. So there is uh, a, a new line of research that is ecological engineering. So in coconut, we call it as Nariel Dwara Atma Nirbhar Krishi. In a coconut plantation, any kind of crop we can accommodate, but the coconut crown should be on the top always. And it is a highly income generating uh, activity also. Uh, we can have the barn owl nest for us, the predators, then honeybee colonies, all these things. And it naturally reduce the pest attack and uh, double the or triple the income for the farmers. So here we can have the bird purchase. Birds are very active predators. So that kind of a that kind of an approach should be there for pest management, uh, not only in coconut, in all the crops. So uh, uh, despite their potential to harm humans, many of these harmful are charismatic and play essential role in the community in the one way or the other. So before going to control a pest, we have to uh, we have to study it thoroughly and uh, something may be biologically unique or fascinating and uh, many things deserve preservation. Sir. But we value everything in our own well-being, that is the problem. So I just uh, want you to be very curious about the insects and let your curiosity leads to fascinations and uh, your fascination to discoveries in future, dear students. And uh, I wish you all the very best uh, in your future endeavors. Set your smart goals, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time-bound goals, and be very good citizens. Thank you, one and all, for the patient hearing. Thank you, Nima. I am done with my talk. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. I just felt like I was uh, sitting in my UG classroom. And <laughs> it was really nice to hear your presentation, madam. Thank you, madam. Uh, so, uh, students, this is open for a discussion. You can ask uh, doubts to madam. Excuse me, ma'am. Yes, please. Uh, ma'am, uh, when we are going for a biological control, at what stage of a plan should we uh, start uh, doing the, um, the preventive measures that we should do? Every pest, there should be an economic threshold level, no? economic injury level and economic threshold level. So that has to be, uh, that is mostly in the, when pest is there, that al already it might have worked out. So before that, we have to start for that. When the, especially, in, for example, I am telling in Opisina, leaf-eating caterpillar, if 20% uh, of the palm already damaged or 20% of the leaf damaged, we say that we have to go for management. So like that, uh, ETL level is already fixed. So before that, before the pest attaining that, we have to go for biocontrol. Even at the initial stage, very early stage also itself is very good. Uh, early you start the better result you get uh, the quantity of uh, biocontrol agent to be released will be very less when we start at the very early stage thank you ma'am thank you ma'am yes rhinoceros beetle attack and red palm we will attack is seen more in hybrid coconut is there any reason for that ma'am yes yeah, sure uh, because hybrid coconuts, uh, I think it is very soft, they are uh, fronds, and uh, it is more sweet. Some research has to be, uh, has to go in that side, I think, because, uh, uh, and the um, palm trunk itself, it starts yielding at a very early stage, you know? so when the fruits are coming out, or the fronds are coming out, that uh, inflorescence coming, there will be a, a certain kind of a damage or certain kind of a, a what to say, um, smell coming out, volatile coming out. So that may be attracting because the uh, um, crown is not very hard that time. So uh, softness and sweetness of the uh, palm, I think these uh, fronds and the crown region is more attractive. And some, some pests attract more to colors also, especially the white flies are more attracted to uh, orange dwarf and uh, uh, 
uh, like that. Okay, ma'am, thank you. There are 38 participants. I think I expect more questions or you are not interested or not fascinated to insects. Sir. No, ma'am, actually it was a beautiful session. Uh, as per the lecture, we have already uh, gone through the test of coconut, but uh, your presentation style and everything was so clear and so beautiful. So, uh, I was on actually asking for your PPT, going to ask for your PPT because all the predators, everything was uh, correctly, uh, there was a chronological order and your presentation, I loved it. And uh, you told about the symptoms and uh, uh, the damage symptoms and the virus, how to inoculate that, how to uh, to ourselves, the culture, everything. Very nice session. Thank you, ma'am. Did any of, uh, one minute. Did any of you notice that there was no legs for red palm evil grubs? Sir? Did any of you notice? What is the reason? Why the I, I told that insect will be having six legs. Uh, so uh, even rhinoceros beetle grub is having six legs. Red palm evil grubs uh, is totally apart as there is no legs in that. What is the reason? You, when you see something, you have to think why it is so, why it is not the other way. Can you anyone tell me the answer? Why the red palm will grubs are not having any legs? Okay, I think time is very precious for you. I'll tell you the answer. The the mother red palm will lays eggs to the palm trunk itself. So it need not have to walk for in search of food. It is laid egg to the food. That is the simple logic uh, what I am telling, but uh, the, your observations and uh, when, uh, whatever it may be, whatever you are encountering in the field or uh, because you are in agriculture and horticulture things, you know, whatever your specialization may be, you always uh, start asking question yourself why it is so. Sakira. Actually, we are uh, live streaming uh, this uh, uh, all the sessions in this uh, uh, YouTube, uh, so you can uh, just see that. And again, we'll be providing a e manual also. With, uh, okay, uh, actually, I was checking the YouTube channel, but I can't the I can't find the last two sessions. So there will be I can okay. check. We will recheck. Uh, so okay. it will be. Uh, it is uploaded. It is uploaded. I just check okay. it. Please check it. Okay, Sahira. If any any issues there, you can uh, inform us. Okay. Any doubt, you can uh, always ask the CPCRI people is there to serve you, you know. Uh, there is a contact now with the CPCRI. So any doubt in coconut, you can, uh, you should ask. Uh, that is the thing. Then only you'll, you can enrich, uh, because you are very uh, starting of your uh, education, this thing now. So what specialization you have to take, where you have to do and things like that. So anything about coconut, you can always approach CPCRI. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, ma'am. Yes. Ma'am, can you tell more about this sensor-based electronic indicator used in red time evil? Yes. Uh, uh, do you want me to show that slide again or I, I'll just tell? Actually, uh, red palm evil, uh, um, red palm evil that uh, farmers detect the stage one, it is totally infested and uh, toppled out. That time we cannot do anything. But uh, when you just hear with our ear itself, very close to the trunk, we can see the knowing sound of the grubs. Uh, little bit practice, we can identify that one. And But uh, all the farmers, it is not possible. So we were always thinking about developing some kind of a detector. And uh, you, you know that um, red palm evil is a major problem for date palm also. So a lot of research has gone in that way in uh, Middle East countries also. They had done X-ray screening, so many things, so many detectors and things like that. So very recently, with a coconut development board funded project, uh, CPCRI Kayangulam scientist has uh, started on this venture. And uh, with a 
private uh, that is a startup group uh, that is Resnova Technologies Cochin. They have developed a uh, uh, sensor based uh, detector. So what it is doing is that uh, there is a uh, actually first uh, the sound produced. It is a acoustic detector sound produced by the grubs by cutting the fiber there is a particular sound so the sensor captured all the sound from the palm so there is lot of sound lot of means mbs and mbs of sound that they have to screen out all the sound and they could identify the sound of a single grub cutting a fiber that sound was so sorted out and that was amplified so the sensor is attached to the palm that takes the sound it scans for two seconds if within the two seconds if that kind of a particular wavelength sound is there it uh, amplifies that one send a message to the computer and uh, uh, the detector has a display unit that shows yes the palm is infected so that is the simple explanation uh, actually a lot of work uh, has gone on the, uh, that side now uh, 80% success we are getting 80% uh, of the palms infested were showing by uh, scanning thus it is infected so it is a sound based one so that the sound was developed by uh, screening out all the sounds and the sound produced when the grubs are cutting the uh, fiber uh, you could get it no yes ma'am thank you Any new questions? Uh, then I think, ma'am, we'll wind up for the day. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you, thank you ma'am. Thank you very much. And yeah. before winding up, um, I have a small announcement for the students. Uh, shall I give it, ma'am? Yes, yes, please. Yeah, so students, uh, uh, this is our sixth class. So we will be um, providing uh, you a. Um, we will be we will be giving you a test paper <laughs> uh, exam uh, for the last six classes. So it will be an online test, and I'll be sharing the mock test of this uh, in the groups. So you can just see that. And uh, after uh, uh, you attend the mock mock test, and if you see if you have any doubts, just uh, inform us. And uh, maybe uh, before the next class, we'll have a. Uh, exam. So we're ready for that. And the uh, best or worst part, I don't know, uh, that we'll be providing the certificate only to people who, who will be attending this uh, exam and uh, we'll be also assessing you. So uh, please uh, uh, um, keep this in mind and uh, attend the exam. <laughs> I have to say this because uh, if there is a, usually in classes, no, if there is an exam here only, they'll be a little more uh, concentrated. <laughs> Concentrating, yeah, yeah. Uh, they will be taking little more of it. But uh, our students are very good. Uh, they are uh, like <laughs> punctual in time. So students, I think uh, uh, I made it clear. Any doubt about that? So Nima, before closing, I would like to thank uh, Director CPCRA and you all group, Jay Shikhar, Nima, and all uh, others for giving this wonderful opportunity to to be with this young group and uh, also energetic uh, one and thank you one and all uh, all the students for the patient hearing and thank you thank you ma'am thank you very much ma'am thank you so we'll uh, wind up for the day okay, okay thank you